Good afternoon, and thank you to the India Autism Center for this opportunity to be here. Um, my name is Lori Unum, and I'd like to share a few more words about my background, just so you can understand the various angles of my involvement in the autism field. For the last 10 years, I served as the head of government affairs for Autism Speaks, which is the world's leading autism nonprofit advocacy and research organization. Um, I'll talk more about my work with Autism Speaks throughout my presentation today, but a lot of the um, journeys that I've had, the professional journeys that I've had, I owe to Autism Speaks, and so I like to start my presentation with a thank you to the organization. I left Autism Speaks in May to serve as the CEO of the Council of Autism Service Providers, or CASP, which is the international trade association that represents autism service providers. So that's my professional journey. I also, about 10 years ago, along with my husband, founded a nonprofit autism uh, clinic in my home state of South Carolina that provides applied behavior analysis services to individuals with autism. I share that with you because although it's not my profession, I'm not a behavior analyst, I'm not a therapist myself, I'm a lawyer, um, but it has shaped my advocacy in the autism sphere to understand the needs of the business community um, in that I am still chairman of the board of this autism service provider organization. So while I don't work here, uh, I am concerned about making sure that it functions properly and serves individuals with autism well. So that's the second part of my, my background and my professional journey. Thirdly, what has shaped my autism advocacy is an academic uh, background or perspective. I have been teaching, I'm, I'm on hiatus right now, but I have been teaching a course at George Washington University Law School called Autism and the Law. And to my knowledge, it's the only law school course, semester long law school course that is devoted entirely to autism. It's been a great thrill to shape the lawyers of tomorrow and to help them understand the legal issues that attend an autism diagnosis and to help them understand it from a parent's point of view. And my husband and I also wrote a textbook to go along with that course called Autism and the Law. But the fourth and final capacity or angle that shapes my involvement in the autism community is that of a parent. How many parents are in the audience today? Yes, thank you for raising your hand high. Yes, I, I'm an autism parent. Actually, two of my three children are diagnosed on the spectrum. I have three boys. The oldest and the youngest are both diagnosed, and they are polar opposite ends of the spectrum. So we live the entire spectrum in my household every day. But it was the journey of my oldest child, my firstborn child, Ryan, that set me on this advo advocacy uh, initiative. So Ryan was diagnosed with autism at 22 months of age, shortly before his second birthday. At the time, I knew almost nothing about autism. I learned from the doctors that diagnosed him that autism was not considered curable, but it was considered treatable to some extent. That it's a medical condition bought, brought on through no fault of the family. So I learned all of the, uh, the common understandings of autism at the same time anyone else does at the time your child is diagnosed, if you're a parent. Ryan, we were living in Washington, D.C. at the time Ryan was born and at the time of his diagnosis. And so we had access to some very fine medical institutions for his diagnosis. And in fact, he was triple diagnosed at Johns Hopkins, at Children's National Medical Center, and at Georgetown. And it's not just that I'm a neurotic parent and I needed to have the confirmation over and over again. I had been waiting so long to get appointments at these medical institutions that I didn't want to give it up once my appointment time came. So he was diagnosed three times during his second year. And looking back, it's really fortunate 
that we had three different sets of medical professionals to diagnose him because they all recommended the same course of treatment. They all recommended that Ryan get into an intensive program of applied behavior analysis, or ABA. At that time, I had never heard of applied behavior analysis. Just like I had barely heard of autism, I had never heard of ABA. And so I did my research to try to figure out what is this treatment, this therapy that the doctors are recommending for my child. And I learned that ABA is a one-on-one -on -one intervention, at least at the outset, and that it might be recommended for your child for up to 40 hours per week. In fact, my child was recommended to be in ABA for 40 hours per week, which made me burst into tears as a mother. I thought, how can he be in therapy 40 hours a week? That's a full-time job. But I quickly learned that his time outside of therapy was non-productive and sometimes destructive. I learned a, a little bit about how ABA works. And so I thought, okay, this makes good sense to me. And it's what the doctors at Hopkins and the doctors at Georgetown told me to do for my child. So that's what I'm going to do. I had ABA specialists come to my home to tell us how to set up a program, and I learned that there's a highly trained consultant level person at the top who assesses your child and develops an individualized program to address your child's needs. And then there are other tiers of providers or technicians who implement that program, who implement the therapy daily with your child. And then I learned that in order to implement a 40 hour per week program, as had been prescribed for my son Ryan, that it would cost approximately $70,000 United States dollars per year. And I remember looking at my husband and saying, thank goodness we have health insurance. What would we do if we didn't have health insurance? Little did I know that at that time, health insurance would not cover one penny of the treatment that the doctors recommended for my child, not one penny. We were fortunate enough to go ahead and set up an ABA program for our son Ryan. We did set one up and he, he began ABA um, programming for 40 hours per week. Being the somewhat cantankerous lawyer that I am, I decided I wanted to find out why doesn't health insurance pay for this. I don't understand. I have paid premiums my entire life or my entire working life. I have paid premiums to have private health insurance so that if something happens to me or one of my family members, we will have coverage. So why don't I have coverage? Something has happened. He has a diagnosis of autism. The doctors told him to get this therapy. Why is there not coverage? I did not understand that. And I got various reasons from the health insurance industry in America. Sometimes they would say, well, that treatment that you're asking us to cover is ineffective or experimental. And I thought, really? Because the doctors at Johns Hopkins told us to get it. I don't think it is experimental or ineffective. I started researching it. And I found that as far back as 1999, the United States Surgeon General said that 30 years of research supports the efficacy of applied behavior analysis for individuals with autism. So that didn't really ring true for me. I didn't understand how the insurance industry could deny my son's coverage on the basis that the treatment was experimental. Sometimes they would say, well, we don't pay for any treatment that's delivered by a non-licensed professional. Well, that wasn't quite fair either. That, that sounds okay on the surface, but at that time in the United States, there were no licenses for behavior analysts, the professionals who are trained in ABA. There was no such thing as a license. In the US, each state has to decide whether they want to license a certain type of professional and no state had decided to license behavior analysts. But that didn't mean they were unqualified. 
We have the Behavior Analyst Certification Board in the United States, in the United States, which uh, has a list of stringent requirements to become a board certified behavior analyst that requires many hundreds of hours of supervision and passage of a, a national of a, a, an exam uh, that's very difficult to pass. So it's not like I was just asking anybody off the street to come in and do ABA with my child. I did have qualified providers and it wasn't fair that insurance should deny the coverage on the basis of no license. Sometimes the insurers would say, well, that treatment that you're asking us to pay for is really educational in nature. You should get the schools to pay for that. And in fact, in the United States, there are some schools that will employ the principles of applied behavior analysis as they are trying to educate children with autism. But it still didn't ring true to me because at core, it wasn't a principal who called me at home and said, your child has autism. It wasn't a school official. It was a doctor. It was a developmental pediatrician and a neuropsychologist who, said, who diagnosed my child with a medical con condition. Just because it happens to relate to the brain doesn't make it any less a medical condition. And so it is appropriate for health insurance coverage. But still, these were all of the reasons that the health insurers in the US would give for not covering the treatment for autism that had been recommended by the medical professionals. Looking back, even though I was faced with all of these bogus uh, reasons for denials of my, of my child's treatment, I realized that we were among the lucky ones. I'm a lawyer, my husband was a lawyer, is a lawyer, we were both working full time, and we were able to make it happen for our child. We were able to live on his salary and sacrifice my entire salary. I was teaching law school at the time, I was a professor, and we used my entire salary to pay for applied behavior analysis for our son. But I was happy to do that. That was a sacrifice that we could make. We also sold our house and moved to a less expensive house so that we could afford to continue his therapy as recommended. But my heart broke thinking about all of the families who did not have a house to sell, who didn't have a second salary to sacrifice, a second lawyer salary. And there were so many families in America for whom there was nothing they could do to afford this treatment that their child so desperately needed. It broke my heart and I thought how painful it must be for a parent to know there's a treatment out there that undeniably is effective for autism, but you can't get it because you don't have the money to get it. And it broke my heart thinking about the children who never had the opportunity to achieve their maximum functionality through ABA. So motivated by my experience with Ryan and kind of inspired by the old Schoolhouse Rock. Now you guys probably don't know this reference, but there was a, an American cartoon series came on Saturday mornings called Schoolhouse Rock. And one of them talked about how does a bill become a law in the United States? And it says it starts with an idea. A citizen has an idea for something that needs to become law. And I was showing that video to my law students one year and I thought, I have an idea. I have a really good idea. I think health insurance ought to pay for treatment for autism as recommended by a physician. So, and by the way, I missed the part of the video that says, but it's not easy becoming a law. I totally missed that. So, um, motivated by that experience, I sat down. By this point, I had moved back to my home state of South Carolina. We were no longer living in Washington, D.C. I sat down and I wrote a very simple two-paragraph bill that simply said health insurance must cover the treatment of autism, um, evidence-based treatment as recommended by a physician, and it seemed so simple to me. Uh, this, makes common, this is common sense and it's good for everyone. Um, I got that bill introduced into the South Carolina legislature and um, that began a very long journey that you can see I've represented as a roller coaster ride and a kick battle because what I thought was a really good common sense idea, not everyone thought was such a good idea. 
In particular, the health insurance industry did not think it was a good idea, and they fought really hard against it. The very first legislative committee hearing on this bill was back um, almost this day, January 12th, in 2006, so 14 years ago. And um, I had never even been to a legislative committee hearing, and they granted one on, on my little bill that I had written. Um, and the, the opponents came out swinging. They, um, they said, well, there were a whole variety of reasons, and I won't go through the whole litany of arguments that they raised against the legislation, but there were many, many reasons why they were opposed to it. And with all their strength and their lobbying power, they fought really hard against it. Um, that's, that's the subject of a, another whole talk. I could spend an hour just telling the stories about all of the ways that they opposed this legislation. It took two years. Um, throughout the second half of 2005, all of 2006, I, along with a lot of other families in South Carolina, fought to get this legislation passed to require health insurance to cover treatment for autism. And finally, um, May 25th of 2007, the South Carolina legislature passed this bill. It had been amended significantly by the time it passed, but they passed this bill to require health insurance. Oh, wait, wait, you can't applaud yet because that's not the end of the story, sadly. Um, I should not do this, I know, but um, this is a picture of the governor of South Carolina at that time who vetoed our bill on the night before the legislative session ended. Uh, do you have the veto here? That means he signs, I do not approve this. Um, and I was devastated. It was 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night, and there was one day left in the session, and he vetoed it. But there's also this procedure in American politics called the veto override. You can go back to the legislature and ask, will they consider overriding the governor's veto? There's one day left. So I have a telephone up there because I stayed up that night calling all the autism families around South Carolina and saying, you're not going to believe this. He vetoed it. Can you come tomorrow? Come to the state capitol? Yeah, I know you don't have a babysitter. Just bring your child. I don't care. Just come to the state capitol tomorrow. So about 75 people showed up the next day, and we pleaded with the legislators to override the governor's veto. Now, if you know anything about politics in America, it was a Republican legislature. It was a Republican governor. They don't like to override the veto of a governor in the same party. But um, we were very fortunate that day, and the very last day of the session, uh, the South Carolina legislature unanimously overrode the governor's veto. And so, right, yes, now you can applaud. <laughs> so, June 7, 2007, the little bill, which came to be known as Ryan's Law, was passed into law. Now, it was different, but as I said, it had been amended many times during the process. So it looked different at the time it passed from how it looked when I wrote it. For example, uh, the child has to be diagnosed by the age of eight. There's no magical number to diagnosis by eight. That was just a political compromise. The coverage extends through age 16. Coverage for ABA in particular extends through age 16. Again, people have asked me, oh, well, what was the literature that supported age 16? There was no literature. It was, there was no justification whatsoever, political compromise entirely. There's a $50,000 per year cap on ABA coverage, although that has since been invalidated by subsequent federal law. So that was the beginning, uh, well, the end of a very long journey in South Carolina. And by the way, the next day, I scooped up my children, put them in the minivan, and drove them to Disney World because I was so tired of the political process, and I felt like I had been ignoring my own children for two years while getting this legislation passed. That, the ending of that journey was the beginning of a new professional journey for me. Um, that was when Autism Speaks contacted me and said, we would like for you to come work for us full-time 
and try to pass that legislation all around the country. In the United States, well, in the United States, you cannot do it just once at the national or the federal level. That's not the way health insurance works in the United States. It is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. So Autism Speaks offered me a job as the head of government affairs to travel around the country and try to replicate this law. So, as I mentioned, I spent over a decade with Autism Speaks, and this is kind of my tour across America as I've been traveling around, meeting with autism families, meeting with provi providers, going with them together to meet with the legislature to uh, educate legislators on autism, on ABA, on uh, how much people with autism can improve with the right intervention. And it's been a fascinating journey, um, which has taken me to all 50 states. Almost done here. So, how are we doing? Um, when I started this journey, uh, there actually was one state that had already passed a law to require health insurance coverage for autism. I didn't know that when I started, but Indiana had passed a similar law back in 2001. Does anybody want to guess why Indiana was so out front on this? They were way ahead. Why was Indiana so far ahead? Bingo! I thought that this would transcend borders. Somebody in politics had a child with autism. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. It was Congressman Dan Burton, uh, who was from Indiana, but by that point he was in the United States Congress, but he still had friends back in the Indiana legislar legislature, and when autism affected his family, he was able to get a bill passed through Indiana. So uh, thank you for that. And that's exactly how it happened. And because um, I think, I, I, I wasn't part of the process, but I think because it happened that way, people didn't really know about it. When we fought for it in South Carolina, as I said, it took two years and it was very controversial and there was a, a lot of debate and there was media coverage. I think when it happened in Indiana, it kind of happened more quickly, maybe behind closed doors. And so people didn't know about the law. And furthermore, it did not, it didn't really become effective when it passed. It didn't unfurl properly and coverage did not roll out for people. It probably rolled out for the Burton family, but I don't think it rolled out on a widespread basis. And so people didn't know about it. So it didn't catch on. In 2001, the concept of requiring health insurance to pay for autism didn't catch on. So this is the map of the United States. I actually keep a map in my office of the United States, and I turn a state green on the map when they pass a law that requires health insurance coverage for autism, including ABA. So this is 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, one time I was showing this and a woman in the back raised her hand and it said, excuse me, your picture is not changing. <laughs> I said, I know, that's exactly the problem. Here's 2006. And then in 2007, when Ryan's law passed in South Carolina, precisely because it was so controversial and widely considered, people did hear about it. And so it started a national firestorm and movement to pass these laws around the country. So Texas was next shortly thereafter. And then in 2008, this is when I went to work for Autism Speaks and really uh, it became a mission. Uh, there were five more states that passed similar legislation in 2008 for a total of eight states. In 2009, seven more states passed the bills for a total of 15. In 2010, eight more states for a total of 23. So we're really picking up momentum then. But I have to tell you, every single state was a battle. There was no state where it was easy. There was opposition from the insurance industry, very strong opposition in every single state. And parents were the ones who really drove the effort and made it happen. This is 2011, we're up to 29 states. 
2012, up to 32, 2013, 34, 2014, 38, 2015, 43, 2016, 44, 2017, 46, 2018, 48, and as of last year, now, finally, all 50 states. Thank you, yes. All 50 states. The last one was Tennessee, uh, which took action in the summer of last year. I got word. I was not in Tennessee at the time it happened. I was on vacation with my family. We were sitting at breakfast, and I got word that Tennessee was doing it, and I burst into tears. And my children said, oh, no, did Grandma die? I said, no, Grandma didn't die. Tennessee passed a law. And they understood instantly and cried with me. So it's been an absolutely wonderful journey. Now, the map really should be 50 shades of green because the laws vary from state to state. Like you saw that in South Carolina, the coverage stops at age 16. In some states, it stops at 18. In some states, it stops at 12. So we're still working to even out the laws and to take away the restrictions, which have no validity to begin with. They say in, in law school, Laws are like sausages. It is better not to see them being made. And that was definitely the case throughout every single state. An ugly process, lots of amendments that had no scientific justification whatsoever. But we had to get our foot in the door, and the foot is now in the door in all 50 states. As I said, Ryan's Law, we've been back to fix some of the, the issues, like the $50,000 cap, but some of the other issues still exist. And so it's an ongoing effort. This is Ryan now. He, uh, not now, this was in 2017. On the 10-year anniversary of Ryan's Law, we went back to try to fix some of the gaps. Um, he was four at the time it was passed. So in the United States, um, all of this work and all of this effort over the last decade plus uh, only covers a portion of the population. Some people are covered by private health insurance to, who, to which these insurance mandate laws apply. Uh, some people have Medicaid, which is our government-funded health care for the poor. And some people have private health insurance, but it's called self-funded insurance. And so um, they work for large companies that have their own health plans, essentially. And so all of those people who work for these large companies do not get the benefit of those laws that we passed in the 50 states. So that has been a separate effort to go company by company and try to convince the management of each company why they should add autism benefits to their health insurance plan, why it makes sense even from a cost-benefit perspective, not, not considering just the human condition, but even considering just the business nature that it makes sense to do so. So here is a sampling of the companies. We have worked with so many companies across the world, really, and here is just a small sampling of the companies who have voluntarily decided to add applied behavior analysis coverage to their self-funded health plan. No law makes them do this. They voluntarily have done this coverage. And by the way, the ultimate self-funded employer in America is the United States government. And we finally also did convince the United States government to add this benefit to their health package. Um, one of the biggest developments in my mind over the last few years is that we finally convinced some of the health insurance companies themselves to just consider this a standard benefit and make it part of the standard package. So for example, United Healthcare, which I believe is our largest private health insurer in terms of number of lives covered, finally just announced, we get it. We understand that children with autism can make significant progress. It's good for everybody. We believe in applied behavior analysis, so we're going to add it as standard coverage to our plan. We also um, have various federal laws in place that uh, help protect people with disabilities, and for this legal purpose, autism is considered a disability within this law, uh, from discrimination in benefit design. So there's been, and one other federal law, uh, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which passed in the United States Congress in 2008, also protects, protects people with mental health conditions 
from discrimination by insurance companies. And again, for legal purposes, autism is considered a mental health condition because it is a diagnosis within the DSM-5, our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So there are, in addition to the 50 state laws which speak specifically to autism, there are a handful of federal laws that are broader but that do apply to autism and offer some protections. Now, so much of what I've talked about thus far applies to children with autism. Some of the laws are specific, and I said they stop coverage at age 12 or 16 or 18. Some of them understood from the get-go that autism is lifelong and did not impose an age cap on coverage. But it's still a work in progress because, as we all know, um, as has been mentioned already in the conference this morning, children with autism become adults with autism. So it's definitely a focus of mine now to um, think about what happens when they grow up. Uh, this picture that I showed earlier with uh, Ryan has his head on my shoulder. Well, this is the picture that's now hanging in my home and my head is on Ryan's shoulder. Um, he's 18 now, he's six feet tall and so I spend many waking hours thinking about what does the future hold. At the Autism Academy of South Carolina, we started a new campaign. You know, I don't know if it's true here. In the United States, still to this day, so many children with autism age out of the school system around 21, 22. They become adults with autism. And then what do they do? Not enough. What do they do? sit at home. They sit at home on their parents' couch. That's what they do. They sit at home on the couch for hours or days or years. And that's sad to me. I know that my son does not want to sit at home on the couch and he does not need to sit at home on the couch. He is capable. My son is very severely impaired. I'm talking about the firstborn, Ryan. He's nonverbal. He's made enormous progress, though, through his ABA therapy, and he can work. So we have a campaign called the No Couch Campaign to ensure that the children that we work with with autism, some of them will go on to be mainstreamed in school, and they will be indistinguishable from their peers. They will go on to lead a normal trajectory, but others will not. But even the ones who don't have those best outcomes, we believe that there are employment opportunities for them, and that's the current focus of, of my advocacy work now. There are laws in the United States as well to encourage employment, to encourage our vocational agencies to help people with autism find employment, to train them better. Money is being dedicated toward providing pre-employment transition services for these individuals with autism. So, um, let me see how I'm doing on time. I haven't heard the bell yet. Okay, um, so, so I, I, the title of my talk references my professional, my political, and my personal journey with autism. So let me take just a minute to give you kind of the parent perspective on the autism diagnosis. Uh, first of all, for me at least, it was emotionally devastating when we received an autism diagnosis. I think it probably would be for most parents, not what you ever expected, and it's, you feel all of the dreams that you had for your child slipping away when you hear the words, right? I, I see the moms out there shaking their heads. It is mentally and physically exhausting. Um, chasing the child around, I mean, I have other children, I know what it's like to chase children around, but. Uh, having to be 24-7 on call for a child with autism is physically exhausting. And then there's the mental exhaustion on top of it, of constantly fighting to provide services and care for your child, of constantly worrying what does the future hold. So for those of you who are providers, just be aware that the families that you're dealing with are both physically and mentally exhausted most of the time. It's financially draining. If you're trying to provide for your child with autism, I, I already shared uh, the financial um, 
requirements of trying to provide appropriate services, particularly if, if health insurance or the government is not helping. And, and beyond that, it's financially draining in small ways. I, I share a story about so many times we would go to a restaurant. Well, when Ryan was little, we couldn't go to a restaurant with him at all. His behavior was too disruptive. It just didn't work. It was not worth it to my family to go to a restaurant with Ryan because it, it was just too hard. But through his ABA, it became better and better. Now we would take him to any restaurant. He travels well. He flies with us. Um, he's made so much progress. But now we take him to a restaurant, and before he learned to be conversant on his iPhone, when, when he was uh, still having difficulty with communication, we had to guess what does Ryan want to eat. We'd ask our children. One wants a hamburger. One wants chicken tenders. Ryan couldn't tell us what he wanted to eat, so we would guess chicken tenders or whatever, spaghetti. And, you know, 80% of the time, we guessed wrong, so Ryan would push it away, and he'd sit there with no dinner. So what do we do as parents? Do we let him sit there hungry, or do we order another plate for him and try to figure out what will he eat? Of course we order another plate. And let me tell you, it gets financially draining when you order another plate every time you go out to eat. So it's just the little things that you might not think about if you haven't walked in these shoes. Autism is challenging to a marriage. Um, I mean, I think that's obvious, but, you know, any time that you're faced with a child with special needs, there's so many, again, it's exhausting, it's draining, and there's so many decisions to be made. I can tell you in my family, as part of the ABA protocol, we have a chart on our refrigerator where every time Ryan has a, a behavior, or has a, a challenging behavior, um, we're supposed to record the antecedent, the behavior, the consequence. It's part of the problem, uh, part of the process, right? We've got to have this data for our, for our team, and we have to say what the antecedent was, what the behavior, you know, did he hit himself on the head, and then what was the consequence? Okay, it's easy to write down what was the behavior. It's easy to write down what was the consequence. Do you know how many fights my husband and I have gotten in trying to decide what was the antecedent to the behavior? We don't know. We don't know. We were both there, and we see different things, and we have different thoughts about, no, I think this caused it. You were talking too loud. No, you weren't looking at him. No, you didn't give him what he wanted to eat. We don't know. And so, you know, just imagine that daily stress on a marriage of to on top of all the other stresses of marriage. Frustrating for siblings. So as I said, Ryan has two younger siblings and one of them is also on the spectrum. But I just think all the time about them and their lives and the constant attention on one child, which I know intellectually they understand, but still they're children, they want their own attention. I think about, um, when we're driving to church some days, Ryan will maybe reach out and try to pinch, and he pinches very hard. That's one of his aggressive behaviors that we have to work with. And when he reaches out and tries to pinch, it used to mean we had to pull over the car, stop, everybody get out, de-escalate. But they've grown up with it, and now one of them just calls floorboard, and so the two younger boys just get down in the floorboard of the car and they ride to church crunched in the floorboard. Is that normal? No. No, that's not a normal family, but it's our normal. It's the way we cope. But I, want, I worry about the impact on the siblings. And isolating. You know, we, we do have friends most of our friends are autism friends. I do have my old friends from high school and college, and they're as understanding as they can be. But I'm sure we don't get invited to all the parties that maybe we would have, would have been invited to or the trips uh, because people don't know. They're, well, should we invite the Unums? I'm not sure. What would they do with Ryan? Would they try to bring Ryan? Will they be able to find a babysitter? Let's just don't invite them. As I mentioned, there's the bell. As I mentioned, um, I have transitioned to, 
as I said, last year we hit 50 states at Autism Speaks, and I've taken on a new role as CEO of the Council of Autism Service Providers, or CASP. And you might think that seems odd. I'm a parent. I'm a parent. Why am I heading up this organization of providers? But to me, it was a perfect logical progression. Um, I spent my career, the, the, the latter 10 years of my career, working to make um, payment possible for these providers through passing these insurance laws. And that has greatly proliferated the supply of providers in the United States. I feel like it's my duty and my honor to uh, lead this organization and make sure that the providers maintain their commitment to evidence-based care and quality services to the families. I feel like it's highly appropriate to have a parent overseeing this organization because my interest is on behalf of the children and on behalf of the families. Um, I'd like to share with you just in the couple minutes I have remaining, there's an, uh, a conference, a gathering that I put on every fall, uh, which I've been doing for the last 13 years, called the Autism Law Summit. And it's a wonderful gathering of parents, professionals, providers, politicians, medical professionals, who just get together each fall and talk about how can we change the law to make it better for individuals with autism. What, how can we use the power of the law to make their lives better? And it started out with 12 people getting together in a conference room, and now it's grown to about 350 people that get together every fall just to talk about using the law to improve their lives. Um, I'm going to... Oh, I'll share this with you quickly. Uh, this is a, a wheel, a wheel of fortune that I had made uh, years ago to kind of depict the um, game show life that autism families are leading in the U.S. You had to spin the wheel twice. The outer wheel shows all 50 states in the U.S. The inner wheel shows all the different kinds of health insurance there are. You had to spin the wheel twice and get lucky two times to get coverage for the treatment that a doctor has prescribed for your child. That's wrong. I keep this wheel in my office still today because it motivates me and it reminds me why we're working to make things better because health care should not be a lottery or a game of chance. Are you guys on Facebook? Yes? Okay. So, you know, sometimes you get a friend request and you don't have anybody in common and a lot of times I'll just ignore those. But this, gosh, this is 10 years ago now. I still remember getting a friend request from a woman and I had no friends in common, but I accepted her friend request. And within a few minutes, I got this message from her. Wow, I read that and burst into tears. I burst into tears and I thought, this is crazy. Somebody is giving up custody of a two-year-old because of a health insurance benefit they don't have. And so I wrote her back. I could, all I could envision was she was sitting in her attorney's office about to sign the custody paperwork. I wrote her back immediately and I said, could you send me your phone number? I'd like to talk to you and please do not sign any papers until I talk to you. So she sent me her phone number immediately. I called her immediately. And I said, could you please tell me who your husband works for? I would like to call the CEO of that company and tell them what is going on in your family. Tell them that you are about to give up custody of your two-year-old child because he has autism and you can't get the benefits you need. She gave me permission to call, and so I did. And I spoke to the CEO of this company, and I said, you know, if I were you, if I were running a company and there were a family in my midst facing this, I would want to know. So I'm calling you just to inform you that, um, you know, this family is having to give up custody. And by the way, she had twins. They were two-year-old twins. One had autism, one did not. So they were being separated. And I said, if you would like to do the right thing, if you would like to add an autism benefit to your company's health plan, I can help you structure that. 
and I work for Autism Speaks. We can shine a positive light on you for doing the right thing. I'd be happy to do that. I said, and if you would not like to, I have friends at the Today Show at NBC in New York, and I know they would love this story. <laughs> and so he decided to add the coverage. And so there's a wonderful ending to this story. She did not have to give up custody. He added the coverage to the company. The child got the ABA treatment. But it does keep me awake at night knowing that there are lots of families like this around the country and around the world. She happened to write to me and I happened to be able to help her. Um, I, all right, I promise I'm almost done, but I have to share two pictures with you before we finish. I like to share these pictures. This is Ryan a few years ago. Um, as I mentioned, he's very severely impaired. I, I never thought he would ride a bicycle. His therapist told me, oh, let's teach him to ride a bicycle. I said, are you kidding? He can't ride a bike. He doesn't even know the word balance. He doesn't, he can't do that. And they ran behind him holding the bicycle for two years until he learned to ride a bicycle. And so this was my favorite picture for years when Ryan completed a little mini triathlon, swimming, riding the bicycle, running. And I, this would never have happened without the dedication of his ABA team. My favorite picture until the next year when he ran the same triathlon, and this is him taking first place. Now, there were no other boys in his category. He was the only one in his age group. But never mind, we celebrate the small victories, right? Thank you so much for the invitation. Good luck, thank you.